Coming up on In the Know, the election results are in, but did LMU students get out and go vote? This is Donna Renteria, homophobia, discrimination, and racism, all found in West Hall on the evening of November 8th. Find out why. I'm Giselle Birang here in University Hall, where an event was held to commemorate an important date in the history of the Holocaust. And I'm Jordan Bull, here with the stories that you need to know. From LMU Television Studios in Los Angeles, this is In the Know, with your hosts, Cornelius Burke and Natalie Nordsen. Welcome to the show, Loyola. I'm Natalie Nordseth. And I'm Cornelius Burke. The November 7th election is over, and Arnold Schwarzenegger has retained his position as governor of California. He will be joined by Tom McClintock, the Republican lieutenant governor nominee. There were also some hot button propositions on the ballot that flooded our TVs with controversial commercials. One of them was Proposition 87, which would have established a $4 billion program to reduce petroleum consumption by 25% and provide research on the subject. Ultimately, the proposition was shot down 52 to 48 percent. Proposition 83 passed with 70 percent of the vote. Once enacted, it would increase penalties for violent and habitual sex offenders and child molesters. It would also prohibit registered sex offenders from residing within 2,000 feet of any school or park and would require lifetime GPS monitoring of felony registered sex offenders. Proposition 85 would have required parental notification before a minor could terminate a pregnancy and a 48-hour waiting period to receive the procedure. Opponents of the proposition argued that minors would be endangered by this law because of abusive parents, and ultimately they won over proponents who favored parental responsibility. The proposition was voted down 58 to 42 percent. The perception is that people our age are apathetic and don't exercise their right to vote as much as other groups. Does that hold true for students at LMU? Did you vote on Tuesday's election? I did. I voted by absentee because I'm from Sacramento, but yeah. What do you tell the students who did not vote? Uh, you know, it's your voice. You know, there's only one way for you to be heard, and so you got to vote. Whether you're, you know, whatever party you stand for, you should vote. What was the number one issue that made you go out and vote? This year, well, there are actually a top three, but I'd say the number one would be education, considering that I'm a student and I work with a lot of students. I'm a tutor, so I go out there and I see what schools are like. The real, it makes a difference, you know. No, I did not vote. <laughs> but wait, I have a le I have a legitimate reason, because um, I didn't know elections were going on. Oh my god! <laughs> Voting is your voice. It's very important that we vote. If we vote, then we can make a difference. We can't complain about what's happening if we're not voting because you're not doing anything to change the politics. I did not vote on Tuesday's election. My absentee ballot, probably somewhere in the belly of the distribution center right now. Unfortunately, I sent in my uh, application for absentee before the uh, deadline and come November 6th, I still had no ballot in my box. I'm ashamed to say that I've been a little out of the loop with uh, politics this year, particularly even though I'd like to be involved. But I was aware of the um, Prop 86 bill that was going to be passed and I just didn't think that was fair for Californians or for the taxpayers, yeah. Prop 86 is a cigarette tax, correct? Yes, that's correct. They were going to raise the um, cost of cigarettes and to make the California taxpayers pay more for this. Here in California, you always hear about the propositions on TV and whatnot. In Tennessee, it's a little bit different. There's not as much publicity about it. But still, you know, if you look it up and you get to really find out the important issues, you can do it online and whatnot. Send in your ballots because that's what it's important. I didn't vote on Tuesday. I was absentee voter. I filled out my ballot and I forgot that voting ended at 8, so I got screwed. <laughs> for those of you interested in examining the results of the election further, the Center for the Study of Los Angeles is hosting a speaker series titled Moving into the Future, Post-Election Results and Beyond. It is being held on Thursday, November 16th from 4 to 7 p.m. in U-Haul 1000. Our campus has been no stranger to issues involving race and prejudice. A special event titled The Tunnel of Oppression was held on November 9th addressing those topics and more. Here is In the Know correspondent Donna Renteria with the details. It's here, The Tunnel of Oppression, an event put together by Student Housing Association and EIS. I think that we're really fortunate here that the mission is so closely tied to social justice issues that this is a program that um, myself and a few other people on the committee had done at other um, colleges and universities that we've worked at. and coming to LMU and having such a strong focus on service and being men and women for others and, and social justice, it just seemed like such a natural tie-in 
Students were taken through various skits that simulated different forms of oppression, like gender bias. She may have been promoted over me, but not because of her professional qualifications. He makes me feel like I have to work so much harder just to prove myself. Racial stereotypes. Not really, I'm not that good at video games. What do you mean? You're Asian, you practically invented video games. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, why would you say that? That's such a stereotype. It's it's like saying all Asians are good at math, or like I'm some docile little Asian girl. I can't believe you. And genocide. One and a half million Armenians were killed out of a total of two and a half million Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. During the Cambodian genocide, Students got to experience being an immigrant deported back to Mexico, with half of each group being on one side of the Mexico-U.S. border. We After completing the tour, like this, some of the students weighed in on their experience. Not being so oblivious to what they're saying and what they're doing that um, I wish everyone could go through this because it's, it's something that we all need to be more aware of. I really found interesting was the reaction of other people, the people that have, uh, are supposed to be offended or maybe angered by this, but their opinions and their reactions weren't exactly that. There were a little bit of laughter. Some people think that this doesn't really happen, which only goes to show the type of diversity that LMU says they have. It shocked me. I was touched by everything. Well, mostly everything. There were some things that were a little over-exaggerated, but for the most part, everything was very deep. And it really humbled like a lot of people, and it made them think about things that really happen day by day that you don't really see. It just makes you realize that you're not exposed to a lot of things. So um, it also opened my eyes to at least get more involved and to seek outside sources because a lot of things do tend to be censored. So. It's up to us to change. A lot of students that um, helped out and volunteered um, as actors, they really wrote their own stories um, from their own experiences. Um, so we want students who came through the tunnel to be able to put faces with some of the oppression. And so maybe later, if they come across um, some experiences of oppression, they can remember back to some of their peers who were telling their stories, and that'll give them some strength and some power to, to confront that oppression. The Tunnel of Oppression was a big success, with over 500 students attending. If you missed it, it will be back next year. This has been Donna Renteria. Back to you in the studio. Thank you, Donna. That seems like quite an experience. On November 9th, another powerful topic was discussed at LMU. The Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts and Department of Theological Studies hosted an event commemorating the Crystal Knot. Here's Giselle Barang with more. Thanks, guys. It was November 9th, 1938 when the Nazis unleashed a horrible wave of violence against Germany's Jewish population. In that one night, 1,350 synagogues were burnt to the ground or destroyed. 91 Jews were killed, 30,000 were thrown into concentration camps, and some 7,000 Jewish businesses were destroyed. This dark day came to be called Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass, for shattered store window panes that covered the German streets. The main speaker of the night, Dr. Natan Kellerman, stressed the importance of continual education of the events of the Holocaust. For the non-Jewish world, however, the lessons of the Holocaust is much more difficult to state. Does the Holocaust have a lesson for the whole of people kind, which is being ignored? Well, the obvious lessons, of course, are the dangers of racism or cruel di dictators and totalitarian regimes, and of the possible of recurrent acts of genocide among human beings. These lessons usually are easily taught, but perhaps not so easily learned. This event brings Some of the, the faculty who members who were present Holocaust explained the relevance that this event has sure. on our Jesuit and university. So by learning about the history of injustice, we understand how it happened in the past, how people were affected by it in the past, and how other people stood by and did nothing. So their presence reminds us that today we can never stand by and do nothing when there's a need to work for justice, when there's a need to stand up against suffering and injustice. So that's why it's important to have them here. One of our goals uh, at LMU is to try and promote 
more of a Jewish studies program. We don't currently have a Jewish studies program, and so we're hoping to create such a program. We're also hoping to hire within the Department of Theological Studies somebody who specializes in, in Judaism full-time. We offer courses in Judaism, but uh, as of yet, we still don't have a full-time professor. After the event, I had the pleasure to talk to some of the actual survivors. My brother was supposed to have had bar mitzvah. In, in a, he was 13 years old in two days. And he couldn't find 10 men. Our law requires when we have a ceremony, we have to have 10 men. And in all of Berlin, you could not find 10 Jewish men to have the bar mitzvah. Because I speak to young people all the time. And, and for the first time, and only in this country, by the way, I see that, and I'm not talking about Jewish children, I'm talking about non-Jewish children who all of a sudden are opening their eyes and even act uh, when, when it's necessary. But I must tell you that it's only in this country. Unfortunately, the rest of the world still is not awakened. And uh, I just keep hoping that uh, uh, you will follow in our footsteps and when we are no longer here, you will tell us stories. This was a night of remembrance, reflection, and contemplation of lessons that still must be learned today from the Holocaust. I'm Giselle Birang, back to you. Thanks, Giselle. That was very enlightening. Something else to look out for is a clothing drive sponsored by the NBA SA. They are collecting corporate casual attire for Close the Deal, an organization that provides clothing to low-income individuals for job interviews and the workplace. This year's drive will be held in the lobby of Hilton, on the evenings of November 16th and 17th. Now to bring you the headlines that are important to you, here's Jordan Bull with The Need to Know. Oh, LMU, sorry, I didn't see you there. This is Jordan Bull bringing you your need to know information for uh, whatever day it is. Here it is. Squirrel attack, Oil City, Pennsylvania. The squirrel is found biting a male carrying the thigh in the back of the neck. The squirrel's whereabouts are unknown, but it was last seen headed to a small Jesuit college in Southern California. Speaking of going nuts, a drunk man was found parked in a nuclear power plant looking for gasoline. When the police caught him, he said he was just using alternative fuel sources. Ironically, this was the second time in two weeks a man has been arrested for being drunk at the nuclear power plant. Speaking of awkward police encounters, authorities were called to a SIGEP party on Thursday. There were reports of weeping, moaning, and aggressive screaming coming from inside the house. Upon entering, police found not one but three men in women's underwear and blonde wigs vomiting on the floor. Oh, by the way, this is in University of Central Florida. In other news, a local Altadena delivery truck was recently burglarized and all 24,000 cartons of eggs were stolen. Reports say there was one individual. In a related story, if you like my fire extinguisher joke, Alex, wait till you see your car in the morning. And Jordan Bull's pick of the week. Greenwood detectives have arrested one man and are seeking a second in the robbery in which a 16-year-old victim told police he was robbed of 5.5 ounces of marijuana and was planning to sell. Greenwood Detective Brent Goebel said, quote, The best part of the case is that Mr. Wolf, the arrested, was free on bail on probation for a weapons charge. At the time of the crime, he was wearing a GPS, Global Positioning Systems Unit, and was tracked to within feet of the crime. And that's all the news there is, Cornelius. Back to you. That's it for our show, LMU. This has been Natalie Nordza. And Cornelius Burke. And now... You're in the now. A drunken man in Oak Park was found drunk. <laughs> this was a night. <laughs> How do you distinguish between clothes and clothes? Clothes. <laughs> Bringing you the need to news. It's okay. <laughs> so this has to make people want to watch it. 
Are you making me do this part? <laughs> I'm like the worst one. Okay. <laughs>